All right, so welcome everyone. I'm Norman Wahlberger. We're at the University of New South Wales. And we're continuing on with this introduction to homology that we started with in the last lecture. So we had a look at this graph X and we computed some aspects uh, of it and explained some initial orientation to homology. And we're going to continue with that today and maybe uh, amplify the situation by uh, augmenting the the space X, so it's a little bit more complicated and has some higher dimensional uh, things too. So the uh, space X has uh, three vertices, X, Y, and Z, has four edges, A, B, C, and D, and it's basically just a graph at this point, one dimensional graph. We define the boundary operator taking uh, an edge, and actually a directed edge like A, to the difference, the formal difference between its final point and its initial point. So y minus x. The boundary of b was z minus y. The boundary of c and of d were both x minus z. So what we're thinking here is that we're working in some kind of algebraic framework where we have uh, the group C0, which is just, if you like, formal combinations, formal integer combinations of the vertices x, y, and z. So things of the form, uh, you know, some things like 3x minus 5y plus 7z, for example. And these are zero-dimensional chains. That's our name for these kinds of objects. And then we also have sort of one-dimensional version, formal integer combinations of the directed edges, A, B, C, and D. For example, uh, 3A minus 2B uh, plus, uh, say, 5D. And we call these one-dimensional chains. And then what we had is we had this boundary operator. The boundary operator extends to a map or homomorphism from C1 to C0. And we defined a cycle, a cycle uh, in C1 is an element T in C1 with its boundary being zero. And we found, by making a computation, that the cycles were spanned by or, or combinations of Uh, two particular cycles, I think we found A plus B plus C and A plus B plus D. So that the other cycle, for example, C minus D was a linear combination of these. And then we defined, sort of in a preliminary way, the first homology group of the space X to be the space of cycles, or it's basically the subgroup uh, of the uh, one chains, which are cycles. And this is then algebraically the sum of two copies of Z, one for each of the generators. All right, this is sort of a preliminary thing, and to, to make it more clear what's going on and to extend the, the definition a little bit more accurately, we have to introduce some additional uh, structures now. So we're going to go up in uh, dimensions, and then we're going to modify the space by uh, adding some two-dimensional cells. Okay. So we're now going to now modify uh, X, let's uh, send it to, uh, say, uh, X2, by adding a two-dimensional cell. And the two-dimensional cell that we're going to choose to add will be right in here. We're going to put in a little plate between these two edges so that we now have a little a disk inside there. And we're going to give this disk uh, a name. Let's call it uh, A. So a two-dimensional cell A between the edges C and D. 
And let's uh, also orient this edge. Let's agree that we'll orient a, a clockwise, meaning that we'll think of this two cell as having an orientation, so looking down on it, it looks like this. So the boundary, so the boundary of this new cell A consists of C and D, but we agree that the orientation induces a particular form for the boundary, namely it's C minus D. The boundary is the loop or cycle going in this direction here. That's what the orientation means. So the boundary of A is by de definition C minus D. That's one of our cycles. That cycle is now the boundary of this two cell. So the cycle C minus D is now the boundary of this two cell. Two cell is just another name for, for disk, two dimensional disk. And let's, uh, so we'll re-label the, the diagram. This is now X2. It's a modification of our uh, space by adding this disk. All right, so now what we can do is we have just not just zero dimensional objects, not just one dimensional objects. We now have two dimensional objects as well. So we need to extend our, our algebra to consider formal combinations of the two dimensional objects. In this case, there's only one so far, so it's rather modest. So, but nevertheless, we'll introduce C2, which is a formal integral combinations of, well, in this case, just A. Okay? So things like uh, 3A or maybe minus 5A. And we'll call these things two-dimensional chains. So we have the situation now where we actually have three different groups. We have C2, we have C1, and we have C0. Zero dimensional chains, one dimensional chains, two dimensional chains. And we have boundary maps going not just from edges to vertices, but now also another boundary kind of operator taking uh, two cells to edges, or to combinations of edges. Now, uh, it might get confusing if we have these different del operators around here. So what we do is we introduce a little bit of notation to make it clear which boundary operator we're talking about. We'll call this one del1 and this one del2. All right. So now we have del1 going from uh, C1 to C0 and del2 going from C2 to C1. All right, so now let's see what, what does the presence of this two cell do in terms of the cycles that we've established uh, previously. So we've already talked about the cycles uh, in C1. The cycles in C1 are spanned by A plus B plus C and A plus B plus D. But now this, this new cell that we have here has, has an effect of creating or sort of reducing a cycle that we previously had to, to zero. So the cycle that we formerly had C D, that cycle is no longer really enclosing a hole. So this cycle here that was formerly a legitimate cycle is no longer a legitimate cycle anymore in the sense that it's homotopically 
shrinkable to a constant. In other words, it no longer surrounds a hole. So the presence of this two cell means that we have to modify our idea of what a cycle is. Formerly, C minus D was a cycle, and it represented um, uh, a, a hole. C minus D is still a cycle, but now it does not represent a hole anymore. And we want our homology to, to capture holes. So it means we have to modify our notion of what the homology is. So the presence of the two cell A means that the cycle C minus D is now homotopic to a constant, namely a zero. So it really, it no longer, it no longer goes around a hole or captures a hole. So algebraically what this means is we actually now want to consider C minus D to be zero as far as measuring holes goes. So we want C minus D to be zero in homology. In other words, as far as measuring one-dimensional holes, C minus D should not count anymore. But then, if C minus D is zero, then the two generators that we have, A plus B plus C and A plus B plus D, are now going to be equal. They're now going to be equal because their difference is C minus D, which is zero. So how do we, how do we say what's, what we're doing algebraically here? Well, what we're doing is we're, or what we need to do, is we need to quotient the group of cycles which was uh, generated by a plus B plus C together with A plus B plus D by the subgroup of one dimensional boundaries. Maybe I should put one dimensional cycles here. So we need to quotient the group of one-dimensional cycles by the subgroup of one-dimensional boundaries, namely generated by C minus D. And that's in fact how we are going to define the homology. The homology is not just cycles, it's what you get when you take cycles and you sort of disregard boundaries or mod out by boundaries. So maybe I'll write this equation that H1 is going to be, uh, by definition, uh, Z1, or maybe I'll just write Z1 without a, Z1 divided by uh, B1, where Z1 is uh, one dimensional cycles, and B1 is one-dimensional boundaries. Well, we do, when we do that uh, in our example, the, the homology shrinks. So from going, so the homology of this new space X2, the, the H1, 
is then we started with the, the cycles, which was uh, Z uh, plus Z. And now we're modding out by the boundaries, which are a Z. So uh, the top here represents the group spanned by A plus B plus C and A plus B plus D. And the bottom group is the span of C minus D. So those are the cycles. And we're modding out by the boundaries. And that's how we define the homology. So in, in this case here, that's going to be just a, isomorphic to the group uh, Z. All right, let me remind you a little bit about taking quotients. So we're talking about taking quotients in the commutative setting. So quotients is a little bit of a, a tricky thing sometimes, so it's probably worth reminding you that there's a very familiar example of, of taking a quotient which you should keep in mind. So the simplest example of a quotient is probably what you get when you take the, uh, the integers and you mod out by a subgroup like, uh, say, 3z. Okay. And what you can think about here is, is this. So if 3z is uh, just the multiples of 3, say uh, 0, 3, 6, uh, minus 3, and so on, inside z, which is just all the integers. So that's a subgroup uh, of z. Then if we draw sort of a picture, roughly, of there's z, and here's this subgroup, let's call it uh, h. Here's a subgroup h, which is 3z. Then it has these two cosets. Okay, the cosets of H in Z are the cosets, well, 1 plus uh, H and 2 plus H. So if this is all the multiples of uh, 3, like 0, 3, 6, 9, minus 3, and so on, then 1 plus H is what you get when you add 1 to all of those. So 1, 4, 7, 10, uh, minus 2, and so on. And 2 plus H is what you get when you add 2 to all of these. 2, 5, 8, 11, minus 1, and so on. Okay. So what we're doing when we're doing a quotient algebraically is we're regarding all of these elements as essentially one object. So the quotient has just three objects, namely the cosets of H in Z. So I remind you that in this case Z mod H is just the cosets of H in Z. And this is the, uh, this is really mod 3 arithmetic. Gives us mod 3 uh, arithmetic. So that if we want to uh, add 4 and 5, so if we want to add this coset and this coset, 1 plus h plus, say, 2 plus h, then we can add any two representatives. We can choose 4 and 5 and add them. If we add them, we get 9, which is in this coset. And it doesn't matter which ones we do. If we choose this one and this one, minus 2 plus 8 is 6. Anyone in here plus anyone in here gives us 1 in here. So the, the addition descends to addition of these cosets. So this would just be H. All right, so that's the same kind of thing that we're doing here, okay? Yeah, with this uh, homology, we are we're looking here at the uh, the cycles, sorry, just Z1, these are the, the cycles. What is this? This is a subgroup. Well, this is a subgroup of, of one chains that basically, okay, in this case, just consists of um, multiples of A plus B plus C and uh, 
A plus B plus D, so combinations of, of these two things. What we're doing now is identifying inside here a, a subgroup, so this is all of Z1, and inside here we have B1, which is a subgroup of boundaries. Inside here is just uh, all multiples of C plus D. So what we're, what we're now doing is we're thinking about having the, a quotient, the quotient of Z1 mod B1, means that we are basically looking at cosets of B1 inside uh, a Z1. Okay. okay, maybe the situation, uh, maybe that's a bit too, uh, looking too big. So cosets, you can think of as being uh, lots of little um, things like this. So in particular, uh, wherever A plus B plus C is, and wherever A plus B plus D is, these are now going to be in the same coset because they differ by an element of our boundary uh, subgroup C plus D. Okay, so that's good, so we have an idea of what the general definition of at least the first homology uh, is. And let's have a look at now another variant. To make it a little bit more complicated, we're going to uh, modify the space X yet again. So let's uh, introduce a third variant. I might draw it again here. A, B, C, D, <coughs> X, Y, Z. We already have the space uh, A that, that goes between C and D. And now I'm going to introduce another cell that also goes between C and D, but is different from, from A. And I might put it around the back. So I have A on the front, and I have B in the back. So what we do is we're going to introduce another two cell, B, between C and D. All right, we should give these cells orientations. We'll stick with the orientation that we had for A. It was going this way here. And um, maybe on the back, we'll make it go uh, like this. So on the back, we'll have an orientation like this. So if you're sort of looking through it, its uh, orientation is like this. So that means that the boundary of B is the same as the boundary of A. It's C minus D. That's still the orientation of the boundary of B. So it's C minus D, so it happens to be the same as the boundary of A. Okay, what is different now? Well, so now the main change is now with uh, X3, the space of two-dimensional chains is generated by A and B. So in other words, it's uh, integral linear combinations such as, for example, 3A uh, minus uh, 4B. And we have now our chain C2, C1, C0, our boundary operators D2 and D1. D1 is unchanged. Now the boundary D2 of A is equal to C minus D, and that's equal to D2 of B. All right, so what's happened to the first 
homology, homology of X3. So by definition, this is cycles divided by boundaries, or to be uh, more precise, it's the kernel of the first boundary map, those are the cycles, modded out by the image of the second boundary map. The image of the delta 2 operator is what we are calling those boundaries, they're the boundaries of two-dimensional things. So we can write image of delta 2. Well, that's going to be the same as, as before. I mean, nothing's changed because the image of delta 2 is still just C minus D, just the way it was in the previous example. So this is still a Z plus Z over Z isomorphic to Z. It's the same as H1 of X2. What has changed is that now we have something in this space which which is a, 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 a cycle in, in C2. So now delta 2 has a non-trivial kernel. Why? Because, well, the kernel of delta 2 is generated by A minus B. We've seen that the boundary of A equals the boundary of B. So the difference, A minus B, its boundary is going to be zero. So that means that A minus B is sent to zero under this second boundary map. So we say that A minus B is a two-dimensional cycle. generating the second homology. The second homology, H2 of uh, X3. So I can write that H2 of X3 is now spanned by the difference A minus B, and so it's infinite cyclic group generated by A minus B, it's isomorphic to Z. And this A minus B, we should think of it geometrically as a, as a, a, a cycle that captures a whole. Okay. This X3, the here, has a, a two-dimensional hole because the two pieces A and B enclose a hole. And algebraically, the difference A minus B is capturing that two-dimensional hole. And that's being represented by this uh, element in the homology. All right, so let's go one more step further and introduce uh, a three-dimensional aspect to this situation. So we're going to take uh, our previous picture and we're going to augment it by add, adding a three-cell now. So X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, and then we had A on the front and B on the back. And so now let's attach a three cell. Okay, a three cell, by that we mean a, a, a ball. A ball in, in three dimensional space. <coughs> 
a solid ball. Okay. We're going to attach the solid ball along the two sphere formed by A and B. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to fill in the space between A and B with uh, putty or, or something rather, so that it's now solid. So inside this space formed by these surfaces A and B, we're going to fill that now with this this three cell, this three dimensional object, solid ball, uh, that, uh, that goes exactly between A and B. And that's called, uh, let's give it a name, attach a three cell, let's call it C. Between, uh, capital C, between A and B. All right, so now we have some three-dimensional objects, as well as two-dimensional, as well as one-dimensional, as well as zero-dimensional objects. So we have our boundary D1 between C1 and C0, our boundary D2 between C2 and C1. Those are not changed. But now we have a new space C3 and a new boundary operator going from C3 to C2. So these are all span, let me just say these are C0 is our Zero dimensional chain spanned by the vertices. C1 is the one dimensional chain spanned by the directed edges. C2 is the two dimensional chain spanned by the directed two cells, A and B. And now we have this three dimensional chains which are spanned by this three dimensional cell uh, C. Well, we still need to sort of decide on an orientation for C. We need to say what the boundary of C is. So let's orient this three-dimensional cell so that its boundary is, well, the boundary is going to be a and B, but we have to choose A minus B because, well, we want this sort of be consistently oriented in the same way that when we uh, take the, the boundary, say, of a, a, a two-dimensional piece, we take this plus this, plus this. We, we make sure that these are all sort of oriented, uh, one flowing past the other. So our orientation for A was in this direction, and our orientation for B was also in, in this direction. And so those are um, not exactly in the same spirit as this. They're kind of uh, going in towards each other along this common edge rather than uh, opposite each other. So we're going to take the oriented A minus the oriented B as the boundary of C. So this ensures that the boundary actually is a cycle. That's one of the properties that we want. We want a boundary always to be a cycle. Okay. We decided before that, in fact, uh, the cycles in C2 were, were spanned by A minus B. So this is a good choice for the boundary of, of C. All right, well, what does that, how does that affect the uh, homology groups? There's now uh, first homology of X4. Well, that's not any different from what it was for X3. Basically, this is just one one-dimensional loop given by this cycle here. And so it's just uh, the integers. What about H2 of X4? So the homology, the second homology, 
is going to again be a quotient. It's the quotient of the cycles here by the boundaries coming from here. So by definition, this is the, uh, the two-dimensional cycles modded by the two-dimensional boundaries. And what that means is we're taking the kernel of delta 2, that's what the cycles are, and modding out by the image of delta 3. Those are, the, those are the boundaries. All right, so what, uh, what is this uh, in this case? What were the two-dimensional cycles? What combinations of A and B had zero boundary? Well, this is the same as before. Those were all the combinations or, or multiples of A minus B. A minus B was a cycle, and all the cycles are just multiples of A minus B. Now, what is the image of the, uh, the chain C? Well, we've said that the image of the chain C is A minus B. So we have to mod out by the same group, the group generated by A minus B. When we mod out a group by itself, we're just getting the group with one element and the additive uh, setting that's just called the zero group. That's the group with just uh, one element. So the second homology has changed. Before we added this cell, the homology was the integers. After we've added the cell, the homology has shrunk to zero, reflecting the fact that that two-dimensional hole has been filled in and there's no longer a two-dimensional hole. There's still a one-dimensional hole that's captured by uh, this homology, but there's no longer a two-dimensional hole because we filled it in. All right, so this is uh, some kind of uh, introduction to the ideas, the basic formula of that we're computing homology by taking a quotient of cycles to boundaries, where the cycles at any stage are the ones that, uh, that uh, get sent to zero by the boundary, and that the, the boundaries are the, the images of the one-dimensional higher uh, chains under it, their boundary map. This is the basic formula for homology. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to you know, you know, make a framework in which we can set this up, this theory up, uh, not just by drawing pictures, but sort of how more formally. And there's, uh, there's a couple of variants uh, of, of doing that, and none of them are entirely easy. Um, so there's basically two... Uh, approaches to setting up a theory of homology. One is the sort of the initial one that uh, Poincaré introduced uh, late in the 19th century, around 1895. It's basically what we might call simplicial homology, where we deal with spaces of a relatively prescribed kind. So the space is built from simplices. Simplices are uh, basically uh, triangles in higher dimensions. And then there's a, a more flexible kind of homology that doesn't orient itself towards such rigid spaces called a singular homology. Maybe not such a good name, but anyway. So it's more flexible, also more complicated, and less combinatorial than the simplicial homology. 
but for most spaces, the two theories end up giving the same homology groups. You, you get, end up getting the same actual groups uh, in either theory, but uh, there's sort of a different orientation. So since this is a beginner's course, we're going to uh, concentrate on the simplicial homology. That's some, really a more simple uh, version, which is still an, powerful enough that it allows us to compute a homology for lots of spaces that, we're, that we might be interested in and that we might want to construct. Okay, so the, uh, this has been sort of a, an introduction, a bit of hand waving. We want to now be a little bit more precise about well, what exactly are we talking about? How do we set these things up in a very combinatorially precise way? And uh, to do that, we're going to have to talk a little bit about uh, these these simplicial complexes, spaces built up from simplices, which are higher dimensional analogs of triangles. So that's what we'll uh, that's what we'll do next. I'll see you then.